today, uh, let me just lay out some foundations. I just want to sort of answer the question in our messages, message, why prayer and fasting, right? And in particular, with a focus on the fast, right? So first of all, let me just start here. What is biblical fasting? So this is as simple as I can possibly make it. Biblical fasting is abstaining from food and or drink for a predetermined period, and that's literally a simple, like, I'm just going to withhold biblical fast, a biblical fast. Now, we've applied the principle of fasting to areas of media and all different types of things, but a true biblical fast is abstaining from food and or drink for a predetermined period. And so we've, we've set aside 21 days, three weeks worth of fasting. And more often than not, you see prayer joined with fasting in both the Old and the New Testament. In fact, I would simply propose to you, if all we do is fast and no prayer, I don't know how much, like like that's fasting or that's withholding from eating, but I don't know, like that's a good cleanse. (laughs) And I pray your physical body gets cleansed, but the incorporating of prayer with the fasting does a lot more than physical. It's very spiritual. And so we we see this, but biblical fasting is now real quick. I'm just going to touch points and I'm going to look at four, four scriptures in the new Testament where we see, uh, aspects of fasting, but fasting is also found in the old Testament in the Bible. Uh, as we see it, it was primarily used as a means of mourning. It was often in response to suffering or disaster. So you see oftentimes a tragedy or something happens. Think for example, a man by the name of Job. And he lost everything, in essence, from, from children to, to wealth to everything that he had in life. And his body was afflicted from, the Bible says, from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet with boils and sores. The Bible says that he, he and often he took his, his garments and he rent them or he ripped them, put on sackcloth, which would be very uncomfortable, and then laid down and put ashes on the head and fasted. So more often than not in the Old Testament, not exclusively, but often we see fasting associated with mourning and it's in response oftentimes to various forms of suffering. Please know this, the Jews were required to fast, required to fast one day a year. In the Old Testament, the nation of Israel was required to fast one day a year. It was on the day of atonement. The Day of Atonement was the Old Testament sacrifice that, fully, that was fulfilled when Jesus came, but it was the day of forgiveness for the sins of the people, the Day of Atonement, when sins were atoned for, and it was on this day that the people fasted. Interestingly enough, in, in researching and studying a little bit more, in the Mosaic Law, the Hebrew word used for fast actually means this, deny yourself. So in fact, when you read in the NIV, at least in the Old Testament, rather than use the the English word fast, you will find the word deny yourself multiple times in Leviticus uh, when it's given uh, this day of atonement in the law. This seems to imply that other forms of self-denial were also intended along with the food itself. The word also means, this is a little bit deeper, we're thinking about fasting. The word also means to afflict, to weaken, to be humbled, or to be bowed down. So think about that for just a moment. And I think one commentator summed it up so well in regards to that. On a day when the sins of the people were to be atoned for, afflicting or denying oneself by fasting would serve as an outward sign of inner repentance, an outward sign of an inner repentance. I think that's crucial as we begin to consider 21 days of prayer and fasting. In addition, the Old Testament mentions both general or corporate and individual fasts. So we see groups of people fasting as well as individuals fasting in the Old Testament. And the purposes including mourning, repentance, seeking divine deliverance, see Esther. That's a great example of when the people fasted. Nehemiah, when the people fasted. 
So just a touch point that fasting is throughout the Old Testament. God's people in the Old Testament were required one day a year on the Day of Atonement to fast. Typically, fasting was a response of mourning, but not exclusively. And then the word to fast literally means in the Hebrew to deny yourself. Are you with me so far? It's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. All right, now, fasting in the New Testament. Here's a couple of key things to note. First of all, nowhere is fasting commanded in the New Testament. So right now I say, okay, well then why are we doing it? Great question. Hang on. I hope to answer that by the time I'm done with the message. Nowhere is it commanded, thou shalt fast. Fasts in the New Testament are found primarily in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but not exclusively, but primarily in the Gospels. In the Gospels, and as we read through the New Testament, we see in particular three, three groups of people spoken of as fasting. The Pharisees, by the way, they fasted on Mondays and Thursdays, for what it's worth. Mondays and Thursdays. John's disciple, John the Baptist, we see that his disciples fasted. In fact, we're going to look at a passage where some people ask some questions. Why, did their, why does John's disciples fast, but not Jesus's? And then we see Jesus himself fasting. And a couple of the references we're going to look at today is Jesus fasting and what we can learn and gain from that. Jesus fasted in the New Testament, in the Gospels, but while he was with them, his disciples did not fast. We'll see that it was only after he left them. So let's take a look at four New Testament passages, and I want you to see some truths about fasting that I think come into play that help answer the question, why prayer and fasting? First of all, Jesus declared that his followers would fast. Straightforward. Look at Luke chapter 5, verses 33 and 34. Remember, I said, uh, fasting is not commanded in the New Testament, but you're going to see, we're going to see Jesus declared that his followers would be people who would fast. So the setting here is Jesus calls a man by the name of Levi, Matthew. He's a tax collector, one of the more hated individuals among Jewish society. They represented the Roman government. They stole from their own people. They were wealthy, but they were very hated. They paid a hefty price for it. Jesus calls this man, isn't it interesting, to be his follower, to be his disciple, and he does, and his life is so changed. He throws a huge banquet and invites all of his tax collector, i.e. sinner, friends. And Jesus shows up, and Jesus eats, he feasts, he drinks with them, he laughs with them, and it's very celebratory. And it's in the middle of, of this celebration, or perhaps towards the end, I believe, uh, that Jesus even says, in fact, let me, I'm going to go off script here a little bit, what you guys have in the back. Uh, look at verse 29 of Luke 5. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? How dare you hang out with people that need to hear about Jesus? Don't you understand that's I'm paraphrasing, but that's literally what the mentality. Why in the world would you hang out the, with the people that need him more than anything? And look at the response. Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And Jesus is like, how am I to call the sinners to repentance if I don't associate and place myself in the company of those very sinners. So there is a model here, like to be in the world, but not to be of the world. But we certainly are called to be in the world so that we can shine the light of Jesus to the world. Amen? Amen. Uh, so now, within that context, look at this. They said to him, John's disciples often fast and what? Pray. So John's disciples often fast and pray. So do the disciples of the Pharisees but yours go on eating and drinking. In other words, aren't you guys spiritual? What's wrong with you guys? Listen to the words of Jesus. Jesus answered, can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? The, himself, right? While he, that's, while he is with them, 
right? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. Look at this next phrase. In those days, they will fast. In other words, I'm here now. It's time for celebration. In fact, here's what I think Jesus was saying here. Jesus emphasized that fasting must be done at the right time and for the right reason. He said, the time is not to fast now while I'm here. There's a time coming when I leave, when my followers, they'll fast then. There's a right time and there's a right reason. You could almost say it like this. Jesus was saying there's a time for feasting and there's a time for fasting. And I think probably if we're, most of us at least in the room would probably say we have just come through a time of feasting and feasted way too much. I'll be the first one to put my hand in the air on that one. So Jesus declared that his followers would fast after he has left. And he has left, and we now find ourselves in that season. Secondly, I want you to go to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. And here's the point, and I want to show you some. And then I want to answer a question that a few of you may have in light of this passage. Jesus emphasized fasting as a discipline. Jesus emphasized fasting as a discipline, which is interesting because let's be honest, all right? I want you to think for just a second. We think about a discipline, it's usually something that we do regularly. We're going to see him including it in a couple of other disciplines that we probably do a lot more regularly. But I wonder if I evaluate my own life and you do yours, would I say fasting is a part of a discipline of my life? So here's the context, and this is so important because I want to ask, answer a big question that's going to come after I read this, all right? You hear me say often, context helps determine the text. So look at the context. It's found in verse 1. Jesus says, be careful not to practice your righteousness, period. No, in front of others, period. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others, period. No, What's the context? To be seen by them. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others, to be seen by them. So we understand the context of what he's getting ready to talk about is the motivation for why we do these particular disciplines. Because he said very clearly, be careful to check your heart that you're not doing these disciplines to be seen by other people so that they will praise you and lift you up. And most people in the room understood he was talking against the the, the cultural backdrop of the Pharisees who did these things to be seen by the people so that they would be praised by the people. He says, if you do, you will have no reward from your father in heaven. All right. So then he goes into three disciplines. Uh, I'm not going to read, I'll read the last part about fasting, but verse two says, so when you give to the needy, not if, when, look at verse five, and when you pray, not if, but when, and now verse 16, because the rest of the passage is pretty, it's almost identical to, in, in all three of the instances, when you fast, Do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Uh, Imagine we're going on a 21-day prayer and fast, and while we're fasting, some of you put makeup on to make your face look more hollow so that those of us will see you when you walk into church and say, my goodness, that fasting is taking a terrible toll on you. Are you doing okay, sister? Are you doing all right, brother? But that's, that's in essence what was happening. And that's what the Pharisees would do. They would literally make up their face so that their face looked thinner so that people would ask so that they would know, wow, look at them. Look at how godly and spiritual they are. Now, let's keep reading because there seems to be a contradiction here like we're doing something wrong biblically by calling for a corporate fast. And I want to answer that very clearly, right? Do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full, which is what? The praise of men. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face. In other words, clean yourself up. Don't even give the appearance that you're fasting. 
so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So Jesus emphasized a couple of things. Jesus emphasized fasting as a discipline. And in fact, we see three things. When you give, when you pray, when you fast. I bet a broad uh, sampling of this group here would say, yeah, pretty consistently we give in some way, shape, or form. Pretty consistently we pray in some shape or form. But when it comes to fasting, I bet there'll be some here you've never fasted. There may be some like you fasted once and it was the Daniel fast last year and no judgment. And I'm not, he doesn't say how often it must be. It's just emphasized that when you fast, that there will be times that we are led to fasting. Now, for some of you that are saying, see, PM, you are wrong. You should not be leading us on a corporate fast because as I understand this verse, it is only be done in secret. No one is to ever know when anyone is ever fasting or when they are ever giving, or when they are ever praying, because that's exactly what he says in the other three disciplines as well. I'm not going to fast because it shouldn't be done publicly. How do you answer that? Because boy, if, if all you have is this right here, we're wrong and we should stop right now, shouldn't we? Well, again, there is something understood in hermeneutics, how we understand or interpret the scriptures. When you hear me say often context determines text that is so important. And the difference is, what is a cultural application versus a universal principle? And this is, in fact, where we even get denominations and where we get sex within denominations as to how people say, no, that's a cultural application or that's a universal principle. Here's what I propose to you, and I wanna, I'm not going to take time to turn to the references. If you want them, we can talk later. But if this is a universal principle in giving and praying and fasting that they should always be done in secret and never be done in public, then we have contradictions in the Bible. How is that? Well, if you read in one of the other gospels, you find Jesus with his disciples standing and watching people give in the temple. And a widow walks up in the temple and she gives two mites. Jesus does not condemn her for giving publicly in front of everyone for everyone to see. Instead, what does he do? He praises her. And he says, you see all these other people? They're giving out of their abundance. But that woman, she gave out of all that she had. And he praised her for actually giving publicly. He didn't condemn her. Mm, here's another example. If we're only supposed to do these things in private and never to be seen, why in the world did Jesus tell a parable to emphasize a point about two men praying in the temple? And one of them stands and says, dear God, I'm a sinner, have mercy on me. And the other guy says, God, I praise you, I'm not like that. My, why did Jesus say, the man who just confessed that he's a sinner, he's the one that goes home righteous. Why then would Paul write to the church in Corinth and give instructions about men and women praying publicly in the services? Why would Paul give instructions to Timothy in the churches and say, in regards to praying, I would that men would lift holy hands everywhere when they pray. See, we have to understand what Jesus is talking about here in Matthew 6 is a cultural application against the backdrop of the Pharisees and his emphasis is on the motivation of our hearts for why we give, why we pray, and why we fast. And what he's saying is, if our motivation is to give, to pray, and to fast solely to be seen and praised by men, we are better off not giving and not praying and not fasting. This is the emphasis. In fact, I want to show you in a minute, we also see corporate fast in the church in the New Testament. If fasting is never to be done corporately as a church, why is a church praised for it? And why is it recorded in the New Testament? And why does the church develop its mission out of praying and fasting together as a church? So see, we have to understand a cultural application versus a universal principle. And when we take in the context and the totality of scripture, we clearly understand Jesus is painting the people against the backdrop of the hypocrites, i.e. the Pharisees, and why they did these things and why we should do these things. This is not to say that we might be led on an individual fast and that we're never to tell anybody about it. 
Certainly that's appropriate. We may be, you, you, you probably gave to needy people all year long and you don't have to come into the church and stand up during a praise and testimony time and say, I just want to give God praise that I was able to bless needy people all week long. That's not right. So we understand the difference here so that we know why we are fasting, all right? Number three, following the example of Jesus. Jesus began his earthly ministry with fasting. Now, this is important to me. Jesus began his earthly ministry before he went to attempt any preaching, before he attempted any healings, before he did anything, he began first by fasting and prayer. So look at Luke chapter four. Luke chapter four. Uh, the, pre the previous passage in Luke three records the baptism of Jesus. In fact, I was reading again this morning. And then verse four, chapter, chapter four, verse one, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. Now look at the next words. He ate nothing. He fasted during those days and at the end of them, he was hungry. <laughs> the Bible is so profound. <laughs> I think we all would be, all right? But notice now, he's baptized, but the Spirit leads him, it's fasting, the Spirit leads him to the wilderness, and he goes into a 40-day time of prayer and fasting. I won't take time to read all of it, but he gets tempted and tested by the evil one. But look now at verse 14, all right? This is after the prayer and fasting. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit after 40 days of prayer and fasting. Before he begins his public ministry, Jesus fasted and prayed. And so I would propose to you that prayer and fasting led to intimacy with and power from the Holy Spirit. And I'm just simply, I'm just, I'm just taking it straight from the text of the scriptures. How do we know he was in? Well, he was walking in step with him so much so that he would be led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Can you imagine for 40 days praying and fasting, no distractions, nothing, not distractions, he was tempted by the evil one, no earthly distractions, if you will. And just pressing in with the Spirit and fasting and praying and communing with the Father. The Bible says that after those 40 days of committing himself wholly to prayer and fasting, he returns and it's, it's, it does not miss my eyes that he returns full of the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm telling you, those of you that have experienced genuine prayer and fasting, there is an intimacy that happens with the Holy Spirit, and there is a power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We seem to hear him more clearly. Our, our sensitivity to sin is like put on high alert. We, we, we just notice people around us. We see all of these divine opportunities. That, that, that is not an accident. Jesus modeled for us, before, and I think about this, it was, it was the thing he did first before his ministry. He was baptized, and then first he gave of himself to the Lord in prayer and fasting. And then he comes back and he ministers. And here we are at the first of the year with a whole, all the potential that the next year holds for us. And what we're saying is, like Jesus, before we launch out in all this ministry that God's going to have for us, we are just going to commit ourselves fully to prayer and fasting. And I believe, like Jesus, we will find ourselves walking in intimacy with and power from the Holy Spirit as individuals and corporately together as a church. How many of you could testify today? I'm not asking you to say anything, just a raise of hands, right? But how many of you, whether in your own life or maybe somebody, maybe a family member or whatever, like through prayer and fasting, you have seen answered prayer? Take a look at the hands around the room. I mean, a large majority of them. We've experienced it. Now, I'm not saying this, that if you put something to prayer during the 21 days of prayer and fasting, guaranteed it's gonna happen. But here's what I do know. If I, you and I walk in intimacy with the Holy Spirit and he leads us to pray for certain things and it's his leading and his directing and it lines up with the will of God, but you better look out. You better look out. 
See, prayer isn't getting God in alignment with our will. Prayer is God getting us in alignment with his will. I, I, I laughed. I jotted in my notes. I just laughed this morning when I wrote it down. It's powerful, but sometimes you can look back on answered prayer and laugh. So I, there was a time out of college, uh, I was working, and I was dating a girl that I had met in college. I'm not telling the story to suggest for you any parents to do this, but if the Spirit leads you to do so, so be it. I was dating a girl, and it was one of those relationships where everybody around me knew I shouldn't be with the person except for me. Have you ever been in one of those? Or you know somebody that's been like in one of those? And yet, just sort of blind, or maybe didn't want to see it, or maybe sort of knew the reality and chose not to see it. Maybe that's the honest answer if I'm confessing before the church today. I found out later that my parents, and especially my dad, were so concerned about the trajectory of this relationship that my dad committed an entire week without food. And he prayed and fasted very specifically for me and this young lady to break up. And as God is my witness, it was probably two weeks after that, I just knew that this relationship was going nowhere. And so I broke up. And then I went to my parents and I'm like, I need to tell you guys something. I, if, you, if you want the really, really fun and funny version of the story, please talk to Lillian, my wife, today. She, she's, it comes full with facial expressions and all kind of stuff. And I said, I just want you guys to know I, um, I broke up with you know, her name, my girlfriend, ex-girlfriend. And they just, had, they just had that look on their face. You know when parents have that look like, of course you did. Of course you did. I'm like, what? Dad's like, it's exactly what we've been praying for. <laughs> like, well, thanks. And then I can't remember. Shortly after that, we had a conversation, and Lillian was my sister's roommate in college at the time. And I'm like, Dad, I, I, think, I think I could see myself dating Lillian. And once again, sheepish grin and look on the face. Of course, that's what we've been praying for. <laughs> and we're married, so be careful what you pray and fast for, right? I think about, all joking aside, I think about what my life could have been had I gone down that trajectory compared to what my life is today. So we've seen God answer plenty of prayers. Finally, let me show you, let me show you a church-wide corporate fast just so you know, like Jesus isn't against people fasting together, <laughs> okay? Acts chapter 13. Oh, I love it. I don't, I don't know, as, as I've looked at this, I don't know that I've ever considered like this right here that like prayer and fasting actually helped the church develop its mission or at least one key focal point of its mission. Now look at Acts 13. John also called Mark. I'm sorry, I'm the, verse one. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, uh, Barnabas, Simon, Lucius, uh, Manan, and Saul. Now notice the next passage. While they were worshiping the Lord and... What? Fasting. While they were worshiping. Now, who's the they? Is it, is it just the few guys here? Well, no, we understand this to be the totality of the church because of what happens next. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, remember, intimacy with, you hear more clearly from him. The power of the Holy Spirit is there. Like this is manifest when the church fasted corporately. The Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had what? Fasted and prayed. The church corporately fasted and prayed. They placed their hands on them and they sent them off. It's fascinating to me that the church at Antioch fasted and received part of its mission to be a church planting, sending church. And they sent Paul and Barnabas out. And they planted churches and they came back. And then they sent Paul and Silas out and they came back and they planted churches. By the way, you want to mark this down. Acts chapter 14, verse 23. Uh, as they go back to the churches and they put elders, they along with the church fasted for who would be the elders and then putting the elders in place. I'm pretty sure that's Acts 14, verse 23. 
So again, you see the church fasting corporately, and it was so powerful here. Like, they got a clear word from the Holy Spirit. You're going to be a sending church, and you were going to go plant churches. Hey, guess what kind of a church Pine Hills is, if you're new to us? We are a sending church. We plant churches. We send people out. We actually rejoice seeing some people leave and go take the gospel to other parts of this city and other parts of this great nation. Like, we praise God for that. Prayer and fasting and worshiping, listen, led to clear direction from the Holy Spirit. I believe for some of you, like, like you look at 2022 and it's hazy. And there's a fog and you're not sure what's going to happen here. I got this decision, Luvonomia. I've been thinking about this. I believe during 21 days of prayer and fasting, the Holy Spirit can give you absolute clear direction for his will for your life. And speak very, very clearly to you. So this is just a sampling. But again, a church corporately received its mission to be a sending church through prayer and fasting. Jesus begins first. You could say he fasted first and then he lived out his mission. This is Jesus. Jesus declared that his followers would be a fasting church. And Jesus himself emphasized fasting as a discipline. So I hope I've answered the question, why prayer and fast? And why we go after it as a church? And all I'm asking and all we're asking from you is to take it up with the Holy Spirit. What does participation look like for you? If God's called you to this body and God is leading this body in 21 days of prayer and fasting, I just simply ask you to take it up with the Holy Spirit. What would you have me do? How would you have me participate? What does fasting look like for me? How would you have me prepare for fasting? God, get my heart ready because I want to hear from you. I want to walk in intimacy with you. I want to be filled with your power like never before. I, I want to I see what this means to just be so sensitive to you and for you to just be flowing through my life that I just have your eyes and I have your thoughts and I have your ideas about my life, about the church's life, and about even the places that you call me to go and you call me to. And hang on, because he may drop some stuff in your life you had no, lap you had no idea was even going to be coming. That happens sometimes too. Even right now, some of you are like, you know, I know exactly what I'm going to target in my prayer. I praise God for this. Some of you are like, I don't know yet, but I'm excited for this journey. And I believe we're going to see God do some mighty things with the body at Pine Hills Church as we give him the first of this year with 21 days of prayer and fasting. And then we watch him do with us and in us and through us only the things that he can do. Amen.